morning. It's gorgeous. Good morning for hunting. So, who's heard of quail since they stopped? What's that? What's that? That's a quail, yeah. There's lots of species out here. And the reason I'm sort of pointing out sounds is most people who study birds, you hear 90% of the birds that are in the environment. The other 10% you might see occasionally. And that's a real truth. When you study birds, you usually hear them a lot more than you ever see them. And so that creates difficulties and actually understanding how many are actually on the landscape. And who's deaf out here? Yeah. I don't so, hear a damn thing. He can't hear anything. <laughs> so, we know Gene's quail population is going to be about 90% less than everybody else's because you can only see them. All right. So, but, this, but it's actually true. And you, you can hear quail now? Yeah, I can hear quail now. They've been calling since we got here. And we're going to be quiet, we're going to be quiet in a minute. So you all know the call of the Bob White, don't you? Who doesn't know the call of Bob White? <laughs> don't know the call of Bob White. So, so Bob White actually say their name. You do know this, don't you? So at this time of year, they'll be going I can't do it loud enough, it's growing out. But let's all be really quiet for a moment and we'll listen, they've been calling. There's one now. And those who have been around quail for a while, who's calling right now? The male. The male. So the cop's calling out there, and he's probably doing a attractive call, and he might be going. And he'll be going on and on and on, and he's trying to actually attract a female. And right now, with Jeff was around here yesterday. Jeff and I found a hen on 14 eggs. Uh, already. Something that's interesting in Florida that we can talk a bit about later is that I don't know if we've got the full idea of breeding phenology here down pat, but that was pretty early. Um, but they probably start laying eggs as early as late March. And if they're really early in these really, really good years, you might actually have really good populations coming this year. Um, we'll talk about that a bit more later though. So we're concentrating on bob white calls here. So we talked about a cop call, all right. Do they make any other calls? Does anybody know? Yeah? That's not very good. But it's good. I knew what you were talking about. So there's some contact calls going on. And so you'll hear these small in the, in the, in the undergrowth. And you can hear quail and it's much quieter and you probably won't be able to hear them more than about 20 feet away when they're like that. The young mate calls, just the other, if you go up to a nest, you're going to get the hen cluck, almost clucking at you, or churring, so they do other calls, and there's a classic cubby call too. But when you come out and you want to understand how many you have, you want to try and do an assessment of your property, or even just understand if you have a bob white there, you need to be rigorous about what you do, and come out and say, I'm going to come to these points, and I'm gonna stand here and I'm gonna listen, and I'm gonna count how many quail I have in every direction I can. So I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna say, okay, there's one from over there, there's one from there, there's one from way, way back over there, and there's one that's a little bit closer. That takes a little bit of time to get used to. It's not the easiest thing to do, and the more you do it, the better you'll get at identifying individual birds. How far do you think you can hear a quail from. So if he's calling out there, how many feet away do you think that quail can be heard? Those biologists back there should know the answer to this question. What was that? That's a long, long way, isn't it? Yeah. So if you get really, really good and you don't have hearing aids or you wind your hearing aids up a lot, lot you can actually hear quail almost 500 meters away. It's a long way. Now, transfer, sorry, transfer that into feet, 1,500 feet. All right, so a, a fair way. 
Now, you don't just want to come to one spot on a property like this and say, okay, this is my quail count, because quail are not going to be the same everywhere across the property. They're going to be in different densities depending on the type of habitat there, the availability of food, what they're up to at that time. But it'll, so you should distribute points across your property as much as possible, but you don't want them any closer than what we just stated, 500 meters or 1500 feet. So you want to try and keep, realistically, you should keep your points at least a mile between them. Right. And that way, you can get them a bit closer, but that way you're never counting the same bird. And once you've counted all of these places, potentially, on your spot, on your property, you say, I've got quail, I can hear them doing bob white this time of year if you're doing a spring cock call. Or in the, if you're doing a covey call in the fall, you can say, I've got this many coveys. You've got an average estimate or abundance of individuals per area of the circle you can hear in. And that's the interesting part that was Pope said back there is that's really hard to estimate exactly how far you can hear every day. But you can just say, okay, I'm doing the same thing every year, and this is an abundance index. And if that goes up and down between years, and you've done the same thing every year, you get an idea of what your quail population is doing. And that's what it's about. It's about getting out there and actually listening, counting, understanding at least an index. It's not reality, it's an index of how many birds are potentially out there. You can adjust it per area you listened, listened on, to the size of what you think is available habitat. <coughs> and I can't remember, what did we adjust it to here, Ken? I can't remember. 53 Kirby. That's what we counted. <coughs> so I think we counted about 53 coveys and we cover a fairly big area, uh, cover quite a lot of the available habitat here. And I think in the long run, we estimated it in the low seven, there's 70 or so coveys on this, potentially on this property just last year. Uh, Bethany. So you don't just need to listen and always say, okay, that's just, that's a bob white. If they're not calling very well, and actually they're not calling well today, we'll say why in a bit later, you can try and get them to respond to playback calls. And so another piece of equipment I would use when we come out to do a point survey count is a Speaker. Yep. An MP3 player. In this case, when I started, it was tape players, of course. Then it became CDs. When Robert started, it was track five. <laughs> but um, when Ken started, it was vinyl. Should have seen him out here with his record player. Called an eight track. Eight track. <laughs> but um, no, so we've got so some of this is getting to some of it's using a little bit of technology too, and that sometimes that can be a little hard to work in. But using a speaker out here, you will increase the probability of actually hearing quail, and Bob White will actually respond to that. Um, who's done a point count on their property, or who's gone out there and actually really, really tried to do it? Um, it's not very many of us and not a lot of people do do it uh, if you do a spring cock call like this you're counting really the breeding population right? and so that's the potential number of pairs that are going to have young on your property and we know from good research that FWC has been doing or tall timbers or other counties uh, other states that generally quail are really poor reproducers okay one did anybody hear it yep. yeah but we can actually assess from that number of breeding pair <clears throat> what the likelihood is is of success for the population how do you how do you know you hear one bird how do you count your cubbies i mean that's just one bird looking for a mate yeah how do you know where the cubbies are you run them up or? yeah so it's a really good question. We haven't got to it yet. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no it's good, good, really good question. Right, so counting, counting a, a, a cock call, we're assuming that every, and when we're saying breeding pair, we're assuming every cock can find a female. All right, so the population is like 50% male, 50% female, and they've sorted each other out. All 
right? When you're counting coveys, it's a different matter. So, you know, you've, you've thought about the shuffle and in overwinter, um, quail are going to become into mixed groups that are not necessarily all related. They're not family groups. They come together and they create a covey. Now, when we count coveys in the fall, you don't know the size of that covey. It could be one bird doing a covey call, it could be 10, and just a few in that covey calling, all right? The secondary thing you really need to do in the fall, if you want to understand your population, is count a few coveys somehow, all right? So you need to count the number of birds in a covey, at least a sample of them, and that can be really hard. What's a good time to do that? Anybody? Hunting season. Yeah. So if you're out there and you're actually and you're actually into hunting and you're pushing those quail up, write down how many you saw. There's always going to be a few you miss, but get an average concept of what the size of your covey is at that time of year. Hmm. Times it by the number of coveys you originally counted, and you've got an index. I'm not saying it's reality. I'm not saying it's the true size of the population. But if you do it the same way across all years, you get an index. There is, I'm not going to get into the science of counting. There's all sorts of little tweaks you can do to make those assessments better. Um, but the number one piece of data you really need is to get out there and count the initial number of coveys. And realistically, the second thing is the average size of a covey. And you can do that two ways. Go out hunting because you're already out there doing it. You could actually flush a covey. So if you've got a dog, great. If you've got good legs, even better. You can actually walk out there and try and flush that cubby. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that's that's managing wildlife. You've got to get an index of how many are there to start with if that's really what you're interested in. Sound good? I got one question. Sure. Tall timbers came out, and there's one section, I'll call it section five. They said there's no birds, but we see them. And there's two, three or four cubbies in that section. But they didn't hear one whistle, so they put down on their count zero. Sure. So how do you work that? Good point. You're right. This, this, he asks great questions. All right. Is it good to go to a count and count once? Or point and count once? It's not. Yeah. And, and they, they probably wouldn't have. I don't think they would have. But there's, there's Bob White calling out here still, so keep your ears listening. The more you go to a point, and count, the closer to reality you get. Does that make sense? If you come back and you say, all right, I counted three, three this time. And then you go in there and you say, uh, today I didn't count any. Well, I know there's three here. I saw that yesterday morning. Right. And then you come back again, you say, I count five. It, it'd be really good if you visited a site repeatedly and actually were able to do that. It's good if you don't do it necessarily the day after, split it over a couple of weeks and come in and get a get a good average count across time. And that's true of, of spring counts and fall counts. And GPS them too, that'd be good too. Always GPS. And actually here, they're standardized points. Um, Ken ran around and we looked at a map and we actually display that and we put in a post and we said, okay, we're going to long term count from this post over time. Sure. But it's a really important point. Um, and the term you're talking about is, you knew they were there, they did through their survey, um, and we call it detectability. So those, bir those particular birds had low detectability and needed to come out again. But it would also suggest that there was either inclement weather conditions, something going on during that time, non-responsive birds. There's all sorts of things that can happen. That's why you need to sort of understand. Well, I think our problem was we had a boy and a girl. I think they were calling each other. Sure. <laughs> I mean, they were going back and forth. <laughs> yeah. We didn't get a good result. So when 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 does the is it good to go and start counting Bob White in February for this spring call? Yes. No. Um, no. Why? Maybe. He's not ramped up enough. All right. This guy right over here is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so there's the time, timing during the year is really important. Right? And so quail do start to, have, they have a season of calling. These Bob White here started probably, I don't know really, it's like they start calling there immediately on nests in Florida right now. So I would say late March they were, they were definitely calling, maybe low, but by 
the beginning of April, they're calling really well. At this time of the year, you can probably do counts right now. I have a... I heard. Yeah. April. When, yeah, April. <laughs> I, but once, once, once a, a hen, hen and a male potentially, and they do all sorts of things breeding, they actually get and they have a nest, right, those Bob White calls can actually slowly drop as well. So he's already actually doing things. So reproduct he's he's been successful. And so he may actually stop calling for a while until a new female comes by that he's interested in or the one that <laughs> there's these things go on. And so th there's those sorts of things that go on. So the peak time to actually count for quail in South Florida is actually I'm I'm not sure, but I would say to me it's gonna be mid April to mid May. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So, and there's people here that have been counting quail in the field for many years, and that, that'd be the best time to do it. How many are here? <laughs> I've counted about eight or ten birds, but my, I got Bluetooth speakers. I can shut them off. <laughs> yeah. So um, what we're going to do is, if you've got questions as we go through the day about counting, things like that, ask me in your in your books. Um, I did throw a covey call count sheet in there. If you ever want to photocopy it, get you started. You can actually just sit in there. You can put Latin long on it study area date observers percent cloud I'm today's an interesting day what's happening with the weather today there's a front coming in what happens when that ha what usually happens the barometer drops you get a pressure drop for other species that I've worked on when that happens they can be really weird and not call a lot not do things all the time so they know that weather's coming so they're bad they're potentially bad days to actually do counts on so this is good